May I ask, uh, how many of you have made a charitable contribution in the last year? Yeah? Ooh, just about everybody. Uh, anybody owe more than a million dollars? Nice. <laughs> well, it never hurts to ask. You never know. Um, I love the charitable sector. Uh, my journey started about uh, 20 plus years ago. I moved to southeastern Wisconsin for a grad program. I needed a job. And my interviewer read my resume and saw that I'd worked in the US Senate and assumed that I knew everything about writing proposals and getting grants and federal money. But I knew precisely nothing, except that I really needed the job. <laughs> so I took that. And that little part-time proposal writing gig morphed into a 20-plus year career in the charitable sector, which has just been amazing, a wonderful journey. I'll share a little bit with you. So it, pains me a bit to share with you that a lot of what I learned in the last couple decades is that the charitable sector is facing some really significant challenges. But I'm also very excited about a pivot. And the pivot is in the direction of this thing called social innovation. It's a movement away from more management around the problem, more of a conventional charity approach, and instead focusing on root causes of problems and then building the models. And that's where the social entrepreneurs come in. Social innovation, a field dedicated to solving social problems, the social entrepreneurs, the actors in the field that build these really cool models where you've got a first bottom line, financial sustainability, got to make a living. But you also achieve a second or a third bottom line, a beautiful social impact. I have some examples for you. So this is what I mean by the pivot away from conventional charity and the management, and instead focusing on building solutions. Um, and mind you, I'm not poking fingers uh, at all charity, right? I mean, I know there's basic needs, there's emergency relief. That's not what we're talking about. I think we're talking about sort of that big fat center where there's a lot of management around the social problem, and I'd like to confess part of my journey in that spirit. You know, after that part-time proposal writing gig wound its way down, I had a series of sort of professional advancement. And within a decade, I was actually running the largest nonprofit organization in the state that focused on youth development. In the course of seven years, we went from 8,000 to 30,000 members, raised $100 million. I had a board of 83. Thank you. I had 83 bosses. And that, my friends, is how you end up pale, bald, and skinny in middle age. <laughs> it was an amazing time being flown around to talk about all the fundraising success and what was working so well. And then, when I thought things couldn't get any better, I got hired to build a private foundation with assets at a billion dollars. It's pretty thin air in American philanthropy. It was also a very heady experience. And what I came to realize is that there are challenges all around on both sides of that philanthropic equation. See, when I was that president and CEO, high flying, flying around talking about all the success and building this largest of 2,500 chapters, that's what we grew to be, the largest in the country, um, I was focused on market share. Because then I could come back to you, and I could say, hey, that, about that charitable contribution, help me out. I've got more kids than ever. I need more money than ever. And I wasn't actually focused on solving the problem. An anecdote. One day, a little boy ran down the hallway, and an excited staff member walked up to me, and he said, hey, Jeff, see that little guy? I had his dad and his dad's dad here. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Our mission statement is to produce productive, responsible, caring citizens. So why are we celebrating multiple generations? Same family, right? Same neighborhood. Deep poverty. Little life skills. All that mattered to me? He was a member, like his dad and his grandfather. That was my market share. That was my mindset. And it led to raising more money. So then when I went to the private foundation side, the other side of the philanthropic equation, I thought, awesome. Now I get to work with amazingly successful people, right? They're super bright. And I'm going to learn their best practices, how they come together and throw in on the models that really achieve social impact and get after root causes and solve the problem. So as the new kids on the block, we threw this nice little hoity-toity soiree. 
And all the who's who in the philanthropic sector showed up, most of the major players anyway. One gentleman who's a very storied figure in the charitable sector in southeastern Wisconsin thanked us for a lovely evening. And then on his way out the door, he turned to me and he said, you know the best part, though? I got to meet a lot of people that have read about and heard about for years. And come to find out, a lot of them make the same types of charitable contributions that I do in a lot of the same types of organizations. So I thought about that. And I turned to him and I said, well, wait a minute. You guys get together, right? I mean, grab a beer, get a cup of coffee, water cooler conversation about the stuff that's really working well, best practices. And he said, we don't do that. I said, really? I mean, the observation went further, that in fact the individualism that had led to such great success in the marketplace, amassing really neat fortunes, that same individualism carried over to their charitable roles, to their philanthropy. So it's a very fragmented space, and donors were not much inclined to actually be working together. Little incentive to do so. So the individualism was actually resulting in very questionable impact. What you haven't heard me say, and maybe this is a little bit of a surprise, that the charitable sector is challenged because of the absence of money. Friends, we will donate as a country more than $335 billion next year. That is a number that dwarfs the economies of many countries in the world. And those little brown stick figures, that's you. Because individuals account for $240 billion of the 335. And there's this thing called the generational wealth transfer that's happening for you Gen Ys and millennials. You've got a lot of financial resources coming your way as grandparents and parents pass away. And these resources fall into your laps. Serious influence with a lot of resources. You also haven't heard me say that we need more charities. Did you know there are now 1.5 million charities in the US? That's a number that's grown by 50% in the last dozen years or so. Think about that. But let's put a little finer point on it. In Milwaukee County, in the year 2000, there were about 4,700 charities. The year 2000, 4,700 charities. In 2010, a decade later, over 7,000. 70% 70 growth in the number of charities in Milwaukee County in one decade. So I ask you, how come with this robust growth of the charitable sector right in our backyard, how come 30% of the residents here live in poverty. Just as one simple, maybe oversimplified indicator of a real social problem. I wonder if it's because of how we look at it, right? The mindset around same old, same old traditional charity and building more management around the problem or working to actually solve it. And is there a difference? Moving away, pivoting away from the traditional, sometimes patronizing pat on the head of, you know, we're just going to take care of you. It makes us feel good. We're not going to ask anything of you, but the message is because we don't think you have much to offer, you can actually leave people in a worse psychological state with that message. But to engage them into being part of their own solution, different kind of equation. So what does social innovation look like when I talk about the solving of a social problem? It does not look like this. This is soap. It's innovative soap. I don't know what that means. I don't know that the dimples actually create any kind of outcome different than the old school bar of soap. We could probably talk for a few minutes about the value, the social value of people using soap. <laughs> if you've tried, well, never mind. But there's really uh, a big difference between this type of innovation and social innovation. Here's a real model that came online up in the Fox Valley just a couple of years ago. Riverview Country Club was the oldest private golf club in the state or it was, because it went bankrupt some years ago. A nonprofit executive running a conventional charity, much like me, I actually worked with her on this, uh, she got the social innovation bug. Her old conventional charity model said, treat them and street them. That was the group think. These were working with people from alcohol and other drug abuse programs, AODA, homeless people, and women from shelters. Treat them and treat them. What that meant was a degree of recidivism. The model actually relied, this conventional charity relied on some systemic failure. Because then she could come back to you and say, I need more money than ever. She could build a county or whomever was backing up the service being provided. So 
when she got the social innovation bug and thought, I can't do this anymore. I gotta figure out how to take these assets like a bankrupt golf course, but include moving a golf course from lower utility to higher utility. Remember, that's the real definition of entre entrepreneur. One who undertakes and moves from lower value to higher value, low utility to high utility, but to engage people in that too. The social innovation, the social entrepreneurship. So today, Riverview Country Club is Riverview Gardens. The former fairway, urban farm. The people working the farm, from the planting or, yeah, the planting, the cultivating, the harvesting of those beautiful organic greens and selling them to restaurants, recurring revenue, first bottom line. Um, those are the same folks that used to be treated and treated, and now they're part of this job training program for people in need in a park setting. They even have a bee colony. They sell the honey year round. And that former clubhouse is actually now a special event venue, sold out all year. Innovative, social impact, social value. Break even in cash flow, just two years old. So no more you know, hat in hand, help us out, we're not gonna make payroll. Uh, increased capacity, beautiful self-sufficiency. Those clients, usually in the cycle of recidivism, off to good paying hourly wages and yes, salaried positions with benefits back with their families. Pretty cool stuff. 35,000 volunteer hours in the community bring this model online. That's its own beautiful social value. How can we get 35,000 people to agree on much anything, let alone this kind of a model? And it's already been a finalist for a national award in social entrepreneurship, the Manhattan Institute. What about urban education? I don't know about you, but boy, it seems like we've got a real challenge across our urban centers in the US. So is there any hope? Well, Crystal Ray is a model that targets the types of kids for a college prep experience that are the least likely to be successful. These are the kids that are facing the biggest barriers, deep poverty, way behind academically, language barriers, et cetera, right? And this model, Chris DeRay says to them, you want this? Come and get it. And they do. They work for it, literally. Every Friday, they go to work, not to school. And the money they earn supports the school. That's part of the financial sustainability. But the kids now aspire. So when you talk social value, if you're the first in your family to understand what it means to actually show up at work and hold a job, and then make the clear connection between, wow, if I work hard academically now and pull myself up, I can aspire to this. And you've got context to aspire in life. Innovative, social impact, beautiful social value. 10,000 kids at roughly 25 schools across the US, right? 100% of these kids, high school diploma. 97% post-secondary, and by the way, they persist. Once they get into college, they persist at a rate greater than the upper class white kid coming from multiple parents, college educated. Pretty cool stuff. Largest high school network in the country now, and what I'm really excited to share with you is that we got this model coming to Milwaukee. Next year, it will be a Crystal Ray School in Milwaukee. Gen Y is all over this stuff. This is one of the things I find most exciting because I've been teaching for some time. You guys have wrapped your heads and minds around this stuff in some beautiful ways. I want to live a long time to watch this and, and watch you riff and iterate. A friend of mine uh, came up with uh, a real concern around slavery in parts of the world, right? His name is Julius. So Julius is building an app. You can scan with your smartphone the tag on that sweater that you're looking to buy, and it will tell you the likelihood of childhood slavery in the manufacturing of the sweater. Now you know. Water, as we sit here on the banks of Lake Michigan, primarily the scarcity of it in parts of the world, right? So pick a country, Zambia. And instead of watching people, usually women, labor in the heat of the day to fill up a jug, carry it on their head back, and have to boil it and sanitize the water. Now you ride your bike. You fill up that reservoir in the back, and on the way back to your village, the pedaling motion induces filtration. You show up with gallons of fresh drinking water. That's the container by the handlebars. You guys own this stuff. You are wired 24-7. You're looking around the world and problems that I couldn't imagine when I was your age. You want to bring your whole selves to work. You're building for-profit and non-profit models that get after root causes of social problems. You've got gifts, skills, and abilities for this moment in time, for these challenges, for a purpose. I'm excited to watch you step up. So if you find this kind of stuff inspiring, we thought the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation would think so too. So, we took a turn. 
We packaged up a couple hundred case studies of the kind of things I'm sharing with you. Average Janes and Joes around the world that rolled up their sleeves, built an innovative model to solve a social problem. And we went to the Gates Foundation and we said, you know, people inspire people. We'd like to inspire the next generation. We can be innovative and entrepreneurial to social benefit, not just private value capture solely. Well, I got a phone call. And they said, yeah, about that. See, we got 1,000 proposals from 85 countries, and we can only pick a handful. But you're one of them. This is real. Check it out. Fixesyou.org. Fixesyou.org is real. Thanks to the partnership with the New York Times uh, and some great case studies. Um, I think I'm looking in the eyes of some people whose stories I'm going to be reading about. I hope so. So there's a big difference between the management of a social problem, conventional charity models, and actually building models that solve the problem. We don't need more innovative soap. <laughs> we need to pivot away from the management and come alongside the social innovators and the social entrepreneurs that want to do this amazing work. Uh, 240 billion individual contributions, generational wealth transfer. It's a lot of influence coming your way, Gen Y, millennials. Uh, I'm excited to see you step up. I'm asking you to consider your role in this movement of social innovation. Let's go change the world. Why not? Thank you. <laughs>